Today on the Expect Miracles podcast, we have a recurring doctor on, Dr. John Stenberg. Dr. John is a Blair upper cervical doctor out of Colorado Springs, Colorado. Very talented doc. If you're out in that area, please go see him. He's uh, very sound in the upper cervical world. And today we're going to talk about what chiropractic school you should go to, which one would be right for you. There's really no right or wrong answer. We're just going to break down everything so you have options and you can choose for yourself. Dr. John, how are you today? Good, man. I appreciate you, you having this conversation because when I went to chiropractic college, I didn't know any of this. Absolutely. I, uh, I had been to a chiropractor's office one time when I went to school. I'd been adjusted one time and uh, I knew nothing. I was a totally blank slate. So a lot of the stuff we're going to talk about uh, will be really helpful for me five years ago thinking about going to school absolutely i i was in the same boat like i i was chiropractically adjusted all my life but when it came time to school i had a couple people telling me oh you don't want to go to that school they don't have philosophy there and i was like i don't even i don't even know what that means so i'm i'm just gonna go where i want to go and uh i chose the warm weather and that's how i ended up in Cal oh and my cousin went there too which was a huge factor yeah. But um, yeah, so it, it, it's definitely um, we're great. We're doing this episode because I don't think many people break it down. So, John, uh, where did you go to school? I went to Life University. That's in Marietta, Georgia. So in the metro Atlanta area, northwest of uh, downtown Atlanta. And that school opened, I think, in the mid 70s, uh, sort of an offshoot of Palmer and some of those types of phil philosophy based schools. Uh, Dr. Sid Williams started that university and it's grown to be one of the larger, maybe the largest uh, chiropractic college. And they've got at least one other branch in uh, somewhere in California, I think up in NorCal, might be SoCal. But So Dr. John, knowing that you didn't really know much to go off of, what made you pick Life University? Yeah, so I actually had one friend who was uh, completing his undergraduate and he was going to go to chiropractic college. So I actually met with him and asked him a few questions about how to do what you're talking about, pick a school and all that. And he went into this whole thing about straights and mixers and all these kind of things that really didn't make any sense. So um, which does play a huge factor. We should definitely get into that. Yeah, we will. And uh, at the time though, it was just confusing. So um, I basically researched, you know, top chiropractic, all that kind of stuff. And I uh, went and visited like four schools on one weekend. So I just flew around the country, wow. did a day at a bunch of different schools. I went to, um, uh, let's see, Northwestern, which is out in uh, Minnesota, went to Life University down in Atlanta. I had visited uh, DeUville, which is up in Buffalo. Um, and there might've been one other, but, but basically, you know, I, I figured I'm going to visit a few. They've got to be fairly similar. And, um, you know, once I have a little bit of context for the campus in the area and all that kind of stuff, I'll just make a decision based on, you know, that little bit of research. So um, it's funny because at some of the smaller schools like DeUville, you know, they schedule a day and they have someone take you around and, and show you the classes and all that sort of thing. And at Northwestern, I spent a day with some students and picked their brains about the curriculum and sat in on a class with them and that sort of thing. And then when I went to Life University, they somehow didn't know that I was coming, even though I had a reservation to do a tour on campus, yeah. all that sort of thing. Well, they that's more actually, of like an actual college campus feel, right? Yeah, I, I'd say so. Just in that they have more amenities, more uh, opportunities there. But I showed up and they were actually in between quarters on break. So there was nobody there. Oh, wow. So I, the campus was dead and I was so confused, but I managed to <laughs> wander my way into the administrative building and I found someone and said, hey, I'm such and such. I'm supposed to have a tour. So they kind of scrambled, found someone to show me around. Um, and it was interesting because I didn't get to see any classes. I didn't get yeah. to meet any students. I basically was, got a 10 minute walk around yeah. campus and some brochures. And so, and I was exhausted from traveling and all that kind of thing. So after the tour, I was a little bit disappointed because it wasn't really what I thought I was going right. to expect. So I just went and sat in what's the cafeteria. and was just kind of thinking about all the stuff, you know, that I experienced over the last couple of days and uh, something about that campus felt right. I don't really know what it was and I still don't have, you know, much of a, a descriptor, probably, but it's just that one of the best things to go off of. Yeah. You know, it just kind of felt like the place for me. So, uh, you know, I went home, thought a little bit more about it. Didn't take me long to make a decision and I applied and started, 
you know, as soon as I could we Absolutely. Think of the, beginning of the next quarter. And what people don't realize, I don't think about chiropractic school is it's kind of easy to get into. It's really not that hard to get into. Yeah. I, when you think about like PT schools and medical schools. I just had this conversation with a friend of mine. He's an optometrist here in town. He's Dr. Justin Manning. And he, uh, we were talking about our experiences. He went to Ohio state university and very competitive to get in. And we were discussing some of, uh, some of the entrance criteria and all that. And I, I was telling him, you know, in chiropractic college, uh, for better or worse, you know, you can make the argument either way. The bar is a little bit lower than, you know, some of those other professional programs in terms of entrance. And so, it, and I was describing to him that at the same time I was applying to dental schools and you had to have X amount of hours of shadowing. You had to have uh, letters of recommendations. There was interviews. There was a DAT exam that you had to pass just to apply. And I told him, I sent my like 250 bucks with an application and three weeks later got accepted. Yeah, it's thought, kind of baffling. Do I you, thought, okay, I guess this is, you know, this is how it works, but I'm in. So let's, do you, you think know, that's let's because it's all like most chiropractic schools are self-funded. Whereas if you go to PT school or medical school, they have all these grants and like, you can go to the university of Arizona physical therapy school. I'm sure what that has a ton of money where chiropractic schools really aren't in the mainstream college campuses. Um, I think that might have something to do with it. I think more than anything, uh, you know, it's about volume. It's, you know, let's get as many people in here as we can. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that, that may or may not be a good thing. Cause I, you know, a bunch of the students that started with me that quarter never saw the end of their first year. So I think it's important that if you're considering doing a doctorate level, very good point. If you're considering doing a doctorate level education, the, the standards to get in are one thing, but what it's going to take to actually see the program through and have the training to get licensed and, and take care of folks, that's a different thing altogether. So I think in a lot Absolutely. of ways, those entrance requirements being low is a little bit deceptive because it's a hell of a lot of work to get through the program and to get, uh, you know, to maintain good grades and to actually, you know, keep your head above water. And so um, I would encourage anybody who's looking at the requirements and say, man, I've got a B average. I yeah. took the classes. I can do this. I mean, yeah. really uh, connect with some doctors and some students and learn about the reality of what the program's like, uh, because it, it was different than I anticipated based on just, just those. Entrances. Absolutely. And a good example of that is I remember my first day of school, I sat next to this kid that got into school. No problem. He never took an anatomy class. Mm -hmm. Never like, right. and, and we were in anatomy. He had no clue what was going on. And unfortunately, he did not last more than two or three weeks and they took like they, his money. He paid his money. He, I'm, I'm not sure if he got all of it back, but so yeah, it is easy to get in, but you definitely have to do your due, due diligence to stay there. Cause it could be a very quick ride for you. No doubt about it. And, and this is an important thing to what to do before you go to chiropractic college. Right. And that's get a biology degree, basically study in a pre-med program. That's going to give you a, a really good background in anatomy and physiology and healthcare terminology and that kind of thing. So you're not, having to learn the language of Absolutely. how we talk about things in healthcare. Those while kids start off flying. Yeah. You know, and I think um, along with that, uh, I didn't know this until after the fact, but you don't need a bachelor's degree to apply to chiropractic college. Absolutely. In a lot of places. My friend and went that route. States, there's some States where you don't even need it to, you know, to get a license. So yeah. that's another thing to consider if you're, if you're looking at those requirements um, you can transfer, you can start that program without finishing your bachelor's degree and complete it along with your chiropractic, save yourself some time and money in undergraduate and get right to work. And uh, that's something I wish I'd have known because I would have definitely done that. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I mean, I took about, I took your bare minimum science courses that you needed to take to get into school while others had pre-med degrees and um, exercise phys degrees. And I was kind of intimidated the first like three months because a lot of the stuff was new for me and these kids just knew they knew what was going on. They knew what they talked about. Now, when that's over, it's a different story when you start learning the chiropractic stuff, but it's very beneficial if you have that under your belt just to hit the ground running faster. Yeah. I mean, it's not by any stretch of the imagination, an absolute requirement, right? There's a lot right. of folks that were in our class that were, it was second careers, right? They had worked in another totally unrelated field and made a switch to chiropractic. And so they were, you know, they were having to play catch up. So obviously stack the deck in your favor because you want to be able to succeed early yes. and gain some momentum and make sure that you're, you know, keeping up with the load of coursework because yeah. the sheer volume of classes and work is going to be much different 
than anything Absolutely. you've done in undergraduate. Yeah. So do everything you can to prepare. But at the same time, you know, if you don't necessarily have all those ducks in a row, doesn't mean you can't. Absolutely. And you just brought up another good point. Um, my chiropractic class, which I'm sure was very similar to yours, but yours was probably way bigger. Um, the age range was pretty phenomenal. It was 20s, 30s, 40s. We had people in their 50s, like doing a career change. Like it is never too late. If you think you're out of time and it's impossible, it's never really too late to make the switch. No, it's not. But I think one thing to consider is the opportunity cost, right? So if you're at 50 years old and you're thinking about making a switch, you also need to understand you're going to invest several hundred thousand dollars in that education. And you need to understand what your career trajectory is going to look like. And if that's, you know, if that's a return on investment that you want to make. (laughs) Another thing that a lot of folks don't talk about with that is it's really expensive, right? And you need to know that if you're going to make that investment, it's only an investment if there's a return, right? Otherwise right. It's, it's an expense. You're, yeah, uh, so, you're dumping you know, money really into dig, the dig deep into the cost to understand what it's going to cost for you to live, you know, in the area around there. Yeah. Um, you know, being in LA, being in Atlanta, I mean, the cost of living is not the same as it is in, you know, say, uh, you know, where NYCC is in rural New York, right? It's a lower Absolutely. cost of living. So yeah. all those different factors influence, how much coursework you can take, um, you know, what your living, your, your quality of life is going to be in terms of outside of school, you know, with your yeah. living expenses and, you know, and there's folks that need to take jobs and do that kind of thing and go at a slower pace to be able to, to make it. Absolutely. But, um, you know, those are all things to consider that uh, yeah. outside of just getting into school and starting in the coursework, you know, that's all things that yeah. affect how well you can do it. And if you are going to make that career change, it might be um, wiser to select a school that's local so you don't have to move out of your place and maybe you can work part-time at the, the job you're still at. So that could definitely cut down on the cost of living and uh, saving some money. Oh, but no. um, Dr. John, let's get into what is a mixer and what is a straight chiropractor because this does play into where you might want to go to school. Yeah, you know, I think in a lot of ways that terminology is outdated and I don't mean it in a way that it doesn't, have a context, but I think the way that it was uh, developed yes. doesn't necessarily, you know, make sense today. So right. what I mean by that is, uh, I guess, historically speaking, the straight chiropractors are the ones that would operate within the, you know, traditional philosophical constructs of chiropractic, uh, maintain sort of a, you know, conservative uh, subluxation oriented practice focus. Um, you know, and the mixers would be the ones that were, you know, sort of on the more of the musculoskeletal pain specialty kind of thing. And so, uh, you know, so with that, there are various, very valid now, like which, which people need to see too. Right. There's, it's not a right or a wrong conversation. And I, I, you know, I I think it used to be. Yeah. Yeah. It's their differences in perspectives and philosophies and, uh, application. And ultimately there's patients that are going to be best suited towards those different styles of practice. Uh, but from an educational perspective, the schools tend to be uh, leaning more one way or the other. Uh, so, you not know, too much there, middle ground. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, and I think that even within the campus setting, there's shades of gray with that. Yeah. Uh, so I went to a school that was more on the traditionally straight side of things, more you know uh, philosophically focused. But it doesn't mean that everybody on campus was excited about that. It doesn't mean that that's all we ever talked about. Uh, and it doesn't mean that, um, you know, we have animosity towards people that practice other ways. You know, speaking for myself, there are people like that. But if you think about the bell curve, you know, and eliminate the extremes, most of us, you know, within the standard, you know, sort of bell curve there, we, you know, we don't, uh, we try not to talk down about how anybody else views things because it's, you know, it's beneficial at the right time and place. So what does that mean that the straight chiropractors focus more specifically on the adjustment rather than soft tissue work and other maybe modalities like STEM and all that. What does that really mean? I think at least for me, and this is just me sharing my own opinion. I think that um, sort of the, the mentality and the philosophy that you approach patient care is, is the difference. Uh, So on the quote unquote straight side of things, we always sort of approach a situation understanding that the body is a self healing organism, that the body is intelligent, uh, that the body knows what it needs and has the the capabilities to heal and grow and continue to adapt to changes in its environment uh, when it's functioning properly. 
And so we always want to work with that. So our orientation and our focus in the entity that we're most fixated on is health. And on the opposite side of the spectrum would be folks that are focused on the problem or focused on the disease or focused on the issue, the dysfunction. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the differences are going to be, you know, we want to support healing and health and we want to eliminate, uh, uh, you know, structural problems that interfere with that process, as opposed to we want to use spot manipulation and a variety of other treatments to alleviate musculoskeletal pain, right? So. Yeah. Um, again, just differences in philosophy. And, and so what that means is how you manage patients and how you kind of view problems is going to be applied through that lens, mm -hmm. right? So someone who's got a frozen shoulder, if you go see a quote unquote straight chiropractor, they're going to say, okay, you know, we understand that the body is a self healing, self-regulating or as an organism, you've got a secondary condition, or you've got a problem with your shoulder. Um, we could treat the shoulder and try to alleviate that. Uh, or we can look at the big picture and say, why is that shoulder dysfunctional compared to the other? You know, what is it that's making the body not able to fix that problem on its own? Mm -hmm. We're going to primarily focus our attention to the spine. We're going to look for issues there and we're going to focus our attention on correcting those issues in the spine. Now, whether or not that 100% heals and corrects the shoulder, the spinal related issues are the primary concern. And so within certain limitations, a lot of that stuff is going to heal and go away on its own. Um, but if it doesn't, uh, you know, you still have full benefit of the care, Absolutely. Uh, whereas on the musculoskeletal, you know, sort of mixer side of the you know, profession, all the focus and attention is going to be on how do we increase the range of motion with the shoulder? You know, how do we improve the function there? Uh, we may or may not incorporate spinal adjustments in that, uh, but primarily the focus is going to be, you know, on alleviating that symptom and, you know, removing that symptom and absolutely dysfunction. and what we're finding clinically now i'm sure you find it a lot in your office um they do work well in with certain patients together so like you said if we t uh, treat the the spinal the bone out of place the structural problem of the patient and we clear it up we'll say that shoulder gets 80 sometimes it gets 100 percent better let's right. say it gets 75 80 percent better and there's still some lingering muscle issues I have absolutely no problem sending them over to a musculoskeletal specialist or someone that's like a, maybe a sports chiropractor that does a lot of soft tissue work. They can take away that other 20% um, of the problem to help facilitate that healing once we get the, the everything else stabilized. Yeah, I think it's just a matter of priorities, you know, and identifying, a, you know, when you're working with a patient based on your training, you know, the best available literature and evidence. Uh, and the patient's goals, that's evidence-based care, establishing priorities for what, you know, what is the best use of their time and money mm -hmm. uh, from a healthcare perspective in a chiropractor's office. And so, you know, based on that, there are going to be a variety of different perspectives and priorities. Absolutely. And ultimately, yeah. If someone's doing conservative targeted care and they have goals and they're using objective testing to measure progress, um, you know, I'd say either way is going to be it is going to be up to the doctor and patient to decide what's best for them. Absolutely. And so, Dr. John, we kind of both went uh, different routes in chiropractic school. Like we said, there's not a lot of middle ground. Your school was definitely a straight school, heavily oriented on um, the just the philosophy and the structural aspects. Not to say it doesn't have the other side, but your school is known for um, a philosophical, philosophical, structurally based uh, chiropractic school. My school was definitely uh, way on the other side of the spectrum where what you kind of talked about was um, if there's a shoulder issues, they're looking at the shoulder, they're using modalities, they're doing a lot of soft tissue work. They don't believe that bones can move out of place. I've had several interesting conversations with the teachers that I ended up stopped having because it would turn out into a full blown argument and it just wasn't worth anybody's time. So. Yeah. Definitely. When I got to school, like there was no upper cervical talk. Um, when somebody said adjust C1, people would literally start laughing. <laughs> I got laughed at for practicing toggle recoil in the adjusting room. And uh, it was not easy. Uh, you definitely have to be philosophically sound in what you're doing if you're going to go to a quote unquote mixer school. Now, not to say it's impossible. If you do go to a school that is um, evidence-based, you can, I'm sure there's a lot of good, uh, philosophically based chiropractors in the area that you could actually learn from while you're going to those schools. And that's exactly how, what I did. I, I was pretty much in a, um, upper cervical office once or twice a week just to learn the technique because 
I wasn't getting any of that at school like you were. Yeah, and I think there's there's a couple of important points to go along with that. Number one is the school setting tends to be so intense because you're studying so hard and everybody's stressed out and you're working like crazy that a lot of these arguments and conversations get just out of hand and they're not productive. So I would say yeah. if you're in school, keep an open mind. I would yes. also keep your BS meter on high alert because there could <laughs> be a lot of people coming through with a lot of wacky ideas. Yeah, You really need to look for consistent principles uh, you know, that you can, you know, observe and apply. But I think keep an open mind and, and you know, let the results speak for themselves, right? And Absolutely. I think, uh, that's one thing that I really appreciate about not having a chiropractic background going into school is I really kind of took everything at face value and weighed it all equally. Mm-hmm. And then based on results and as my education, you know, progressed, you know, started to weed out the things that didn't really fit with my values and my perspectives, in the way that I, you know, see myself practicing, you know, but at the same time, there were times where I was one of those idiots that got involved in you know, those conversations and were saying, unqual- making unqualified statements just based yeah. on what I heard someone in a technique yeah. seminar say, and you, you really don't know anything in school. Absolutely. So you should keep an open mind and, uh, you know, a, and a look at a lot of different perspectives because absolutely any one school isn't going to give you everything that you need. Yeah. And, and listen, so I think that, what you did was was the right thing to do is spend some time outside of the clinical academic setting, spend some time with doctors in the field and see what the day-to-day is like in yeah. different types of offices. Because, um, you know, in, in a lot of ways, even in a clinic at school, it's it's just way far removed from the reality. Absolutely. Of and practice. you definitely got to do what feels right for you. There's over 200 chiropractic techniques and some people walk into school and they know exactly what they're doing on day one. Others are kind of floating around. And what you said, you kind of said it perfectly, have your BS meter going, and, but also be open to techniques because there are some wild chiropractic techniques that look really strange, but they are very effective. Like, for instance, my buddy, um, Dr. Ben Benuis, I had on this podcast, he's a NSA doctor. If yeah. you look at that technique from afar, you are going to look and say, what the hell is that? That looks like total BS. What's going on? And he is getting amazing results in his office. He was like the only kid in class that kind of was like, what's going on here? I want to look further into it. Everybody else kind of dismissed it. And he is just, he's doing phenomenal work because it, it really resonated with him. And I think that's huge when you want to pick what you kind of want to do after school or during school. Yeah. And like I said, I I talked to other healthcare providers. I spent a few hours with a TMJ specialist here in town. She's a dentist that, you know, interviewed Dr. Justin Manning. He's an optometrist this morning. And, you know, we had these same conversations where there are a lot of different unique ways to focus in any healthcare field. Right. And so there's room for everybody. As long as you're doing quality work, you have high integrity and you're, you know, conservatively providing good care to patients. There's room for all of it. But I think it's, um, you know, when it comes down to, you know, consistent principles, you know, those are the things that you want to look for. There's, there's going to be stuff that comes up on the fringes and some people just like to be on the fringes and that's okay. You know, but for me, I tend to be more analytical, tend to be a little bit more, um, you know, wanting to see data, you know, to back stuff up and, uh, you know, just knowing myself, you know, I tend to gravitate towards things that incorporate that as a routine part of the care. So you got to be self-aware. You got to know what your values are. You got to keep an open mind and evaluate a lot of different things. And even if you don't end up using all of that stuff in your practice, it's going to increase your perspective. So when you're managing patients and you're, uh, you know, seeing that not everything is solved with one particular intervention or approach, uh, it's important to have other things in the back of your mind to evaluate and say, you know what, Um, we've gotten you to a certain point. You could use this other thing to kind of tie up some loose ends or, you know, my approach is the right thing for you, but here's another perspective to consider rather than giving up on chiropractic care altogether and all that sort of thing. So I think, uh, you know, in a lot of ways, you know, that open-mindedness doesn't mean that you have to accept everything, but you just take it in, you weigh it and you, you know, make decisions based on your values. Absolutely. Now, Dr. John, knowing what we know now, uh, we are upper cervical chiropractors. We have graduated. We really didn't know much about the field when we started, what is the best option? What are, what are the best options for people that are going into chiropractic school? They've had, they've had their own personal experiences with upper cervical. They like it. They want to go for it. What can be their next step for, to a good upper cervically sound chiropractic school? There's a couple good options. 
Yeah, I think um, Life University in Atlanta, where I went to school, is, is probably your best option. Uh, and it's not the best school for everything, but I will say this, being in Atlanta, you have a lot of opportunities to be exposed to a lot of different types of approaches and techniques. We had, um, I took at least three different upper cervical techniques as a part of my elective courses. So I was able to evaluate outside of all the other adjustment techniques we learned, those three specifically. And there were countless seminars that came through town because it was such a big hub and a big city and really accessible. So I think you know, that would be at the top of the list. I think Sherman uh, College of Chiropractic is in Spartanburg, South Carolina. They're in the East Coast. They've got a really strong upper cervical presence from what I've gathered. Yeah, I mean, I've heard the same thing. On campus. They're always hosting seminars. Uh, and, and one good thing about Sherman is it's relatively close to Life University. So it's like a three hour drive. So even if you're there and there's something that you, you know, want to get into at Life, we would have kids from Sherman come down all the time for seminars and vice versa. So yeah, very true. Kind of get with those two, you almost kind of get the accessibility of both. Uh, so that's something to consider. But other than that, Life West uh, on the, you know, satellite campus on the West Coast, that's another. Probably West option. Coast. I would say that's your best option. Especially for Blair. Upper They've got cervically. a really strong presence there. Uh, and then the Palmer campuses, from what I understand, have somewhat of an upper cervical presence. I know Dr. Todd Hubbard, who's a you know, great uh, Blair. Oh, you're you're going to get a good good understanding of Blair for him, definitely. He's on staff there. You can actually use Blair in their clinic system. So yeah. you know, a lot of these things that you learn, you may or may not be able to practice on campus in the clinics. So that's another thing to consider when you're looking at those techniques and, and learning them is, is how you can use them as a part of your education. Um, and then other than that, I think, uh, you know, few and far between in the U.S. are schools that have the opportunity to learn upper cervical care as a part of your curriculum. You know, Absolutely. Yeah. So that being said, um, I think we were talking about it before. Parker, I think they have a pretty solid club there where they it might not be in the clinic or the curriculum, but there are students that are active and uh, just have a hunger for learning the upper cervical techniques, which is good. Um you know, and for what it's worth, if you're at another school, if you're at Logan or NYCC or Northwestern, you can start an upper cervical club. There are doctors that travel all over the country to teach and engage with students. And yeah. you can have ways to access those resources wherever you are. You don't have to be at one of these schools. Very true. I know Dr. Yeah. Ian Bulo, for example, you've had him on the podcast. He'll go anywhere. He'll go anywhere and everywhere. Yeah. And I love it. And that's yeah. great. So, you know, if, you, if you've got the motivation and you're really passionate about this kind of thing, uh, you can make it work wherever you are. And that was more or less your experience. That is a huge point. You can make this work at any chiropractic school you want to go to. I mean, and we were talking about it before the first year and a half, maybe even two years is strictly book work anyway. So everybody's kind of got to get through the same thing before you could even start exploring these avenues. Right. The way the curriculum is structured, um, which is a good thing to talk about it is more or less based on the board testing system. So to be a licensed chiropractor in any state to practice, you have to have passed four parts of a national board exam. The first part of that board exam is the basic sciences. And so you essentially spend the first six quarters, year and a half of school, becoming really knowledgeable and proficient in the basic sciences. And after you pass that first part of your board exams, things start to turn to more of the clinical work and more of the chiropractic focused stuff. But that's essentially your scientific foundation for everything else that you're gonna learn. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's a huge part of the initial, you know, like you said, year to year and a half of the program. Absolutely. It, it, really, it can really bog you down because there's really not much hands on learning. There's not much chiropractic technique that you're learning. Yeah. In which case, being involved in clubs and doing some seminars really keeps you fired up because otherwise, you know, you can really get bogged down. Absolutely. And um, although my school didn't have an, a strong upper cervical presence, they were phenomenal at getting you through the boards and passing you through that, which the end result, that's really what it's all about. Because if you can't pass the boards, then you're, you're not going to be a chiropractor. It doesn't matter what you know, right? Yeah. Exactly, yeah. And I'm sure that goes with a lot of the other schools. I, I mean, listen, you just you need to get into chiropractic school. You need to pick a location that's going to be right for you. You got to pick something that's going to be financially right for you. And you need to get the piece of paper that is the degree. Those are, I mean, that's pretty much what you need. Yeah, they're going to have the same base curriculum, which is geared towards that uh, you know, that CCE or Council on Chiropractic Education uh, standards. And those standards are what, you know, are preparing you for the board exams and you need the board exams to get a license. So you're exactly right. In a lot of ways, a chiropractic college is, is getting you to the point of licensure and is getting you to be 
qualified as safe, as knowledgeable, as efficient, as meeting certain standards, both clinically and academically, to be uh, you know safe out there in the general population, taking care of people. But uh, one thing that we used to have assemblies weekly, or you know, a couple times a quarter at Life University, where you would you know basically go listen to a speaker, you got a credit for it, uh, and everybody would gather in the gym, do that kind of thing. And and I remember uh, we had a doctor, Arno Bernier, was there talking one time, and uh, he had gone to Sherman College, like back when you know they were really hardcore and straight to philosophy, and learned from some you know, legends in chiropractic. And he was talking about when you're doing that, like we're talking about, you know, a lot of the curriculum is, is really oriented towards the testing. It's not as applicable to your day-to-day practice. hundred percent. So he encouraged us to, uh, you know, make for yourself a parallel curriculum. And this is learning philosophy, focusing on different types of techniques and things like that, and, and dedicating time and resources outside of what you do as a part of your normal coursework to learn some of that stuff. Because if you just wait for it to show up at some point in your education, you're going to be disappointed and you're really going to miss out on a lot of opportunities. Well, yeah, that's a good point. So if you were just, uh, if you were into upper cervical and you were just like, you know what, I'm just going to focus on getting my education, getting the piece of paper, and then I'm going to graduate. It's going to take you some time after you graduate to really get the technique down and you're not going to be ready to go for a while. So that parallel curriculum of getting what you need to have done and also knowing what you want to do at the same time is uh, you want to kind of have converge at one point because it's really nice to be ready to go after you graduate. And it's yeah, tough it's really upper it's cervically really, if you're not. Yeah. And it's really going to force you to, to prioritize your time, right? Because you're going to have a lot of demands. I mean, we're talking, I think, we took upwards of 30 some credits in a 10 week quarter. So you're talking 60, 70 hours of coursework, you know, on top of clinic, on top of studying and all that sort of thing. So you're, you're really spread thin. And so yeah. you have to, you know, have to prioritize and, and manage your time really well if you're going to do that. Yes, and I, absolutely. You know, I think and it's a really important thing to do anyway, but I just know that it's going to, you know, it's going to create, you're going to, there's going to be some sacrifices other in other areas of your life to. Oh, to absolutely. To and this is like, this might be the, one of the most important things on my list is find a mentor, find somebody that's doing exactly what you want to do and do everything that they do and make it your own at the same time. Because I'm like in the upper cervical world, we see some very extreme, difficult cases that I personally, I still, obviously I still struggle with some really, some really bizarre case I've never seen before. You have to have a couple doctors on speed dial to send the x-rays, get their advice. Have you ever seen this before? Because that in turn can help that patient. And I've, I've had so many cases where just didn't, I didn't know what to do at some points. And I would hit up Dr. Liz Hafer or Dr. Hall or Dr. Buo. And they've given me so much valid pieces of information to help that patient that you need that to succeed. Yeah. And, and all those docs you mentioned and a bunch of others, they're, very willing to help students yes. out and young doctors out. It's not like they're inaccessible or they're not open to collaboration. They love it. And they're very open to that. So it's, if you don't take advantage, you're only you know doing a disservice to yourself and your patients. And I think there's, you know, w- within those few that you mentioned, I know Dr. Meg Banich is Dr. Uh, Banich was like, I can't believe I didn't say that name. She was probably the biggest influence ever on me. So, I mean, that's like, you know, 70 years worth of combined clinical experience that you have to tap into there. And that's really, really valuable. It's invaluable. Absolutely. So uh, when you think about that, it's you're, and this is my perspective, you're unlikely to find those types of mentors on campus. Yes. I think that people who are teaching in chiropractic colleges are very disconnected from the reality of chiropractic in the field. And that's not a knock on them, but that world is so condensed. And so um, you know, and, so and they got so much other stuff to worry about, like getting students credits and all this stuff. It's just, it's not really clinically, it's not really the real world. Yeah. They're just disconnected. Right. And so yeah. I think that's important to go, you can have those mentors on campus, but it's important to go outside, you know, as well. And Dr. Charmaine Herman, who teaches on campus at life, if it wasn't for her coming in from the outside and being engaged in chiropractic curriculum and education and mentoring students, I would have never known about Blair chiropractic. I would have never been a Blair patient and I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing. So, uh, you know, folks like her and Dr. Chris Lee, if you're in Atlanta, they're two great Blair doctors in the area that are also very open and welcoming and, uh, you know, are great resources. So, you know, if you don't know who those folks are in your area, 
you can reach out to someone who's practicing upper cervical and say, hey, I'm a, I'm a student at such and such college. I want to learn a little bit about what this is all about and who do you yeah. know around here that I can connect with? Cause there's, there's someone, you know, near every school that would be, you know, open and willing to do that. Absolutely. And so Dr. John, I actually, a thought popped in my head, but I might want to make this an entirely different episode. Um, like how to open your own practice out of school. Cause we both kind of did that. And that's a, I, I think that's a whole conversation in itself. Yeah, that deserves, a, <laughs> that, that deserves at least an hour. That. We'll definitely do that another time. No doubt. But, um, Dr. John, any final thoughts on um, what, uh, what people can do to pick a chiropractic school that's right for them or any advice for students currently in school? Uh, two different things, I guess. Uh, if, you're, if you're preparing to go ahead of time, I would uh, definitely spend some time in offices before you get to school. Because one of the things that's going to happen is – you get so far along in school and you get in so deep and you get in over your head, you know, that a lot of times it's, it's easy to just keep going because it's what you're doing. And I graduated with friends who are already out of practice and selling insurance and, you know, working other jobs and doing different things. So you just spent four years of your life and a quarter million dollars to get this degree and it's useless to you, right? So you really need to know, number one, this is what I am supposed to do, not what I think I can do or what I want to do or it seems like a good job, but especially with the type of work we do, you really have to have almost a, a calling to it in oh, some yes. ways. Uh, and so I'd say, you know, really be sure about what you're doing. And I can think of one student who um, actually in our first upper cervical class it was the end of the, fir- the fourth quarter. And he would always have this talk at the end of the class, Dr. Franz. And it was basically this conversation. He's like, look, you guys are in it far enough now that you need to really look within yourself and and be honest about, is this the right thing for me? Like, should I see this through and then go into the field and do it? Or am I maybe a little bit off track? And if you are, that's okay, but you need to know before you get it over your head. And I remember a friend who was sitting in front of me at school. He he didn't show up the next quarter. And I talked with him about after the fact. And he's like, you know, that that really impacted me. My dad was a chiropractor. My uncle's chiropractor. I just went because I thought I should, and I thought it would be a good career. And he's like, it just wasn't for me. And, you know, when I, when I did that, when I was introspective about it, I figured, you know, he's right. And, Yo, and good he's for off him. doing something else and he's thriving and loving his life. And I'm like, that's awesome, man. You did the right thing. Those people that go all the way through and they, you know, they struggle and they never really get it. You know why we're doing chiropractic and what it's all about. And I feel bad for those guys because it becomes Absolutely. very hard to do the things that we're doing, especially if you start a practice, you're new into practice, all that kind of thing. Like you really have to have a strong sense of purpose in this. Absolutely. You. If you don't know why you're doing it, it's going to turn into any other nine to five job. You're going to hate waking up. You're going to hate going to work. You got to know why you're doing this. And um, it's amazing that you can actually change other people's lives with your hands. And if yeah, you, man. isn't that crazy? It is. And and to come full circle back to the sort of the entrance requirements and that sort of thing. I mean, don't go to chiropractic college because you couldn't get into PT school. You know, don't go to chiropractic college because your grades weren't good enough to go to med school and you can be a doctor Mm -hmm. by doing this. I mean, that's just, it's a disservice to you. It's a disservice to your community and your patients. And uh, there's too many, there's too many folks like that out in our field. And I think that we've reaped, we're reaping the benefits of that type of approach in the way that, you know, our communities view us and, and our status in the culture. So, Absolutely. Uh, you know, so I think it's really important. And uh, if you have to take a break, if you have to take a year between undergraduate, if you need it, I mean, don't rush into it, don't rush through it, you know, make sure that it's, uh, you know, it's going to be a, a, an investment for your life rather than, you know, just the next step in your academic career. Perfectly said, Dr. John. Dr. John, where can people find you on social media and your website and all that? Yeah, my practice is called Zenith Chiropractic. I'm in Colorado Springs, so on social media, Zenith Chiropractic, uh, Zenith Cairo on Instagram. I host a podcast called Thrive for the Cause. Yes. COS, short for Colorado Springs. Uh, So we have conversations with folks in the community here about all kinds of different things. And so uh, you can also check that out as well. Um, And if you find me online at zenithchiroco.com, if you hear this and want to have more information or you have questions or things like that, connect with me through there, send me an email, you know, we'd be happy to chat with you and answer any specific questions. If you're a student in school and you're trying to figure out next steps, we can help you navigate that. Uh, If you're thinking about going to school and you have more questions, we can help you navigate that. Uh, But I appreciate you, Kevin, for, you know, asking me to do this because I think it's, 
it's a really important conversation. It's, and it's one that I didn't have before I went to school. So I think it's very valuable. Absolutely. I agree. I feel the same way. Dr. John, thank you for so much coming on. Uh, maybe next episode we'll talk about, um, you know, how do you uh, start building your own practice after school? Right on. That'd be, that'd be a good one. All right, brother. I'll talk to you soon. 